we, yes, we saw yesterday a bit uh, what VSS looked like, and also hemocytes function. And because Fabian already showed you how important are VSS, I'm entitled to talk about VIA differentiation today. And what I will do today, we start from seeing what VIA look like, uh, a brief overlook, and then we, the function of the different types of VIA, where do they come from, how do they differentiate, and then uh, time allows, I will go into more um, evolutionary consideration, which are not so, not only philosophical consideration, but they may have an impact on, on some uh, pathways that we have been particularly interested in. So <clears throat> I will start. This is what um, the nerve core of the differentiated embryo looks like. Um, so I told you yesterday, this corresponds to the spinal cord invertebrate. In red, we have all the axons bundles in um, so the neurons, basically, in the ventral cord. And in green, you have a nuclear marker for <coughs> glia, which is this protein called Ripple, which you will hear more about later on. And you will see how <clears throat> the ventral cord is completely decorated with these glia cells, but also the peripheral nerve that get into and get out of uh, the ventral nerve core. If we now make a section, transversal section, in the ventral cord, we can uh, look into the glia composition. So this is a section of what we have seen before. This is the dorsal part of the ventral cord. This is the ventral part of the ventral cord. And you will appreciate that here you have different uh, compartmentalization of this uh, tissue. So we are, have here the connectives. These are the longitudinal connectives that run all along the ventral cord. So these are bundles of axons, which are surrounded by two types of glia, uh, the EG glia and the AG glia. And these are very different features, morphology. In particular, this one gets really into the axon bundles and surrounds axons. Then there are other types of glia. These are the cortex glia, uh, which are amongst neuronal cell bodies. And more externally, we find two types of glia here the subperineural and the perineural glia, and these form the so-called BBD, the blood-brain barrier. So this is a totally impermeable structure. Nothing gets in, nothing goes out of the nervous system, which makes it as an immune protective tissue. And surrounding the ventral cord, we have the hemocytes, which are, I think, the hemocytes, some of them. Of course, also the neural um, tissues in the periphery, the nerves, are also covered by um, glia cells. So you, you will appreciate that these are different positions, different organization, and also different molecular cues that are necessary for that. I will re-show one of the pictures that I showed yesterday so that you can appreciate the uh, shape of the glia cells in green. Here are the neurons. And these are the hemocytes. Now, if we rotate the image, you will see that the hemocytes are not within the ventral cord, but they are sitting on the top. And we, you, you will also appreciate how different positions and shape are the glia cells. So, what do the glia cells do? Um, by this, I would like to uh, stress that we initially, when we discovered we are sent, we, I mean the community discovered we are in flies, we all took them as a whole. And that was a, a, some kind of a simpli uh, simplification of the, of the question, because in fact, different types of glia do different things. You heard yesterday how much glia cells are necessary in the glutamate uh, pathway. And this is also true, by the way, in vertebrates, the importance of astrocytes in that pathway has been already established in invertebrates as, as well. And you will appreciate here that in a control animal, this is again a ventral cord, a fraction of it. And you will see here in green the glial cells, uh, in gray are the nuclei of the neurons, and here in red are again 
the hemocytes that are surrounding the ventral cord. Now, if we take a section in a wild-type animal, you will see again the connective, which is this hole, due to the fact that these are axons, so there is no nuclei there. In the dorsal part, you will have different types of PL cells and the um, hemocytes that are surrounding. If you look at the mutant that affects all the VR cells, uh, the VR cells are destructive in, in structure and organization, and you start also seeing um, hemocytes that are getting into the uh, ventral cord. So the first uh, part, the first function that we can allocate to VR cells is integrity of the nervous system. And this is uh, a role that is played by these cells here at the surface, that is a subperimural and the perimural view. Leakiness in the blood brain barrier makes it possible for things to get in, including the hemocytes. So they have uh, a very structural role. And this goes back to uh, the name of glia, which in Greek means glue. And initially, the glia cells were considered as being simply structural uh, component of the nervous system, which was also a very strong simplification, because you will see uh, how many other functions the glia cells have, and even more in uh, the vertebrate nervous system, where they even have a role ha as real stem cells. In fact, a lot of stem cells are astrocyte in nature. So clearly, we have... Um, Glia cells have been called altogether glia, but they are very different populations. The only thing you can say is that they are all of neurotelema origin, that, and they don't have uh, synapses, even though. <laughs> uh, but that's all. Then different types of glia do different things. So BBB has insulation and protection role. And then if we go into uh, more internal cells, the cell body glia, which are here, which are amongst cell bodies of the neurons, these, uh, have, these cells have very high, uh, important role in phagocytic activity of the dying cell body. As in vertebrate, a number of neurons die. That is the developmental pathway. Those debris must be taken out of the system, otherwise they will be toxic. And this is accomplished by the cell body glia. So again, this is in a wild type condition. You have the glia cells with the cytoplasmic processes. And these are the dye cells in red. And you will see that these are just engulfed, and this is through scavenger receptors. So this is the cell body glia, and now we move to other cell types. Uh, this is a slide taken from my C. Turan, who, who has been very much interested in uh, phagocytic activity. This is the apoptotic bodies that we just saw from the cell body glia. And then um, the group of Mark Freeman and others as well have defined the role of uh, other types of glia in removing synaptic debris on axon pruning. As I was mentioning yesterday during the practical, uh, during development, flies have a double life. <coughs> so they live as worms and they then live as adults. And you may appreciate that between a worm and an adult fly, there is some kind of difference. You know, wings, legs, reproductive system. So you have to cope with restructuring of the nervous system, which means that some neurons disappear, some axons are pruned, more axons are sent again, and new neurons have to be generated. So in the axon pruning and the, uh, destroying the synaptic uh, debris, we need to have the activity of this aging glia, astrocyte-like glia, which enter the neuropile and surround the axons, and in this way they can phagocyte those, again through other scavenger receptors, uh, these uh, debris. And this is not only in developmental condition, but also in, uh, in upon injury. So this is the way um, to show that glial cells really are the immune cells of the fly nervous system. And uh, I will open a parenthesis to some of you already discussed with some of you yesterday. This means that in evolution, we have simple organisms, few cell types, complex organisms, more cell types, not only more genes, but also cell types. Because this function, uh, which is an immune function, uh, which is extremely important to keep the nervous system functional, 
is accomplished invertebrates by other cells, which are the immune cells derived by the yolk sac, and move into the brain during development. These are the microglia. They were called glia, uh, again, uh, because of their position, uh, and they were not neurons, that is, and they were small, that's it. <laughs> uh, but in reality, they are of mesodermal origin, and they move into the brain, then the brain gets sealed, so again, nothing gets in, nothing gets out, and that is the major scavenger population of our nervous system. So if we get an injury, the microglia cells are the ones that will react. Um, and you will see perhaps later on, in, all, in many neurodegenerative disease, autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis, etc., the microglia are fundamental player. In some cases, they are aggravating the disease. In other cases, or in other phases of the disease, they are instead suppressing the uh, inflammatory, for example, reaction. So this means that we start in several organisms that have glia cells that do a bit of everything, insulation, uh, phagocytic activity, response to inflammation, uh, in sheeting, broadly speaking. But then this must be accomplished by different cells. And in particular, invertebrates, microglia, have taken up the immune function, even though one of the ectodermally derived glia, the astros, has still accomplished some of those functions. But we need now, in a complex tissue, a very professional scavenger. All right. Close the parenthesis. Now, where do these clear cells come from? And I will show you a movie. <coughs> this is a section, a transversal section of a blastoderm. So, single cell layer of the epithelial layer. This is the dorsal part. This is the ventral part. You will see in the movie that this part here moves, and then we have a gastrulation, so this part will invaginate uh, and will become the mesodermal tissue. This will be the mesoderm, the single row of cells, and this then will produce the nervous system. This is the neurogenic region. You may remember um, what Tom was telling before, yesterday, that within this region you have a territory which is really partly giving rise to ectoderm, partly giving rise to neurons, through uh, huge, uh, mm, uh, very long pathway of latter inhibition and cell-cell communication. So within this <coughs> tissue, that in the, in the end will be here, located here, you will see that some cells delaminate and become the neuroblasts. And the neuroblasts are the equivalent of vertebrate neural stem cells. So these neuroblasts divide, they produce intermediate precursors, and then they will produce neurons and via, because neurons and via have the same origin. Oh, no, that's too fast. All right. So here we see the movement, invagination, gastrulation with mesoderma uh, differentiation. These two cells get here. And from these cells, you will see some cells that are delaminating. These are the neuroblasts. These cells start dividing. They produce the ganglion mother cell, which are these intermediate precursors, and then they will build up the neurons. And this has been established uh, in detail. So these neuroblasts produce, at each division, different types of neurons and glia. Uh, they also different along the anterior posterior axis through the activity of the homeobox containing genes. So they are different in space, in, ta in time, <clears throat> and also along the dorsal ventral axis. So it's a very complex um, organization that has been very well established. And the advantage here in Drosophila is that we can really identify each and every stem cell, each and every neuro and neural and cell anglia. So if we want to see the real thing, this is a longitudinal view of um, an embryo at stage nine, and you will appreciate here, we start seeing this uh, uh, pale green labeling, and this will really become um, the nervous system. This is, in fact, is a fake movie. It's not a movie. It's, not, it's only taking different uh, images at different times. 
Oops, that's also too fast. Yeah. So you can see here the formation of the nervous system. This is the central nervous system. Uh, this is the, uh, the ventral cord here. And this is the brain. And here, we will appreciate the nuclei. This is a nuclear lady of all the sensory organs. And this is at the end of uh, embryogenesis. Now, this tissue is formed by different types of stem cells. Uh, the typical cell division, asymmetric cell division, so one cell divides and produces another stem cell and an intermediate precursor. Or if we need to increase, to expand the pool of uh, of uh, neural stem cells, which happens in the optic lobes, the structure that we saw yesterday, very early in development, you need to expand the pool of neural stem cells, then you have a proliferative, uh, self renewing but symmetric division. There are other uh, divisions in which the neural stem cell divides and it produces just two cells, which are differentiated. And uh, a very fascinating aspect of this is the quiescent state of some, some stem cells. And this is what happens in our cell body, um, in our organism as well. So what I mean by that is that at the end of embryogenesis, the larvae have to move, to feed, to sense, whatever. So they are, the organism is ready, and the nervous system is functional. However, you must keep some reserve for when you have to go through metamorphosis and produce the nervous system that is necessary for the adult. So if you have wings and legs and a productive system, you will have to produce no circuitry, no neurons, and you will have to have stem cells um, undergoing proliferation again. So we have quiescence here at the end of embryogenesis. Most of the neural uh, stem cells either die or stop dividing. The ones that stop dividing resume division during the larval life so that they can make sure that they will produce the neurons and the glial cells that are necessary for the adult life. So this happens in, during the larva life, and this is metabolism dependent. So if you have a starved larva, there will be no reactivation of the neural stem cells. But more importantly, this is absolutely mediated by uh, cells, again, bl blood-brain barrier. And you will notice that the blood-brain barrier in the embryo had uh, a simply structural function by insulating the nervous system. Here, it is absolutely important to receive the, uh, the, the metabolic cues. And in this case, these cells will then secrete DILP, which is uh, an insulin peptide, that will be then uh, taken up by these cells here, and this will be conveying a uh, mitotic uh, signal. If you don't have these cells, again, you don't have reactivation of the nervous system. And this has been established by a number of groups like Andrea Brand, Alex Gould, and so So this means that we have very complicated, complex uh, organization of the cells, functions, different functions, different types. And the question is, how do these cells differentiate? So what is controlling gliogenesis? And the reason why I'm saying that is that although we have a huge number of genes that are necessary for neuronal differentiation, uh, we didn't know how glial cells were differentiated. And we were very lucky when we and other groups found one and a single gene that is necessary and sufficient to induce differentiation. This is an image of the uh, gene that we already saw, repo. It's a nuclear homodomain containing gene that is decorating all the glial cells in the ventral cord, <coughs> in the brain, in a wild-type animal. These cells come, as I said, from a neural stem cell-like cell, the neuroblast, that divides several times to produce neurons and glia. If we remove this single transcription factor, no glial cells differentiate, and they don't differentiate because they become neurons. So there is a really uh, what in the past used to be called a master gene, whatever. <laughs> So this is the 
Uh, it's a very unusual zinc finger protein, a uh, transcription factor, which is an active regulator that is necessary for biogenesis. But even more interestingly, this is one of the few factors that is also sufficient in the sense that if we use this uh, uis for system to express this gene GCM throughout the ventral core, you will see that all the cells become glia at the expense of the neural fate. So we normally have neurons and glia. In the loss of function, you have no glia whatsoever. And in the gain of function, everybody becomes glia. And as a matter of fact, you can even do that in other tissues. You can take the mesoderm, you put the, this protein into the mesoderm, and you will get glia at the expense of muscles. So it's really an important gene, uh, an important transcription factor. What was really bothering me at some point was that this transcription factor was uh, necessary and sufficient, yet it's only expressed very early in development. So if we look at time, in the via lineage, we see a peak of expression of GCM, and then it goes away. The target gene of GCM, which is VIPO, instead stays on for long, I mean, throughout development. So how do we get this differentiation, and how, what is the relay uh, mechanism? And in fact, what we have found is that uh, GCM induces the expression of repo, and we must reach a threshold level so that repo really takes over and becomes independent. And if that doesn't happen, if, that is, if this level is not reached, the cells will go back and will remain neurons. So the idea was, OK, we have a first signal, which is a trigger. Then we have something which is staying, uh, staying being expressed. And this gene, repo, will be the molecular relay so that real differentiation uh, proceeds, and uh, they can express the real state. So that is also all nice. And this fitted with the fact that if we look in development, the glial uh, precursor cells in the ventral cord express uh, GCM and then expression fades away. And if you look in the same embryos, uh, at the same stages, I mean, for people, you will see that people is expressed at the same time and stays on. So that was a simple way to look at. You simply need this homeodomain containing protein to stay on and to express the late markers. And this, as a matter of fact, is the image that I already shown to you before. This is, again, the wild type embryo in which you see the ventral cord with the neurons, the glial cells, and the hemocytes. And in fact, the new that I was alluding to before is repo. And so in, in these animals, you will see that there is a total disruption of the ventral cord. This was all nice. We knew also that the late markers for glia were not expressed, but then more recently, we revisited this phenotype, and we realized that in the repo embryos, in the repo mutant embryos, and by the way, repo is the only protein that is expressed in all the glial cells, we start seeing something that we did not expect. So this is a control animal, and this is a segment of, on the ventral cord. In green, we have a, a transgenic reporter for glia, which is the one that you see yesterday. These are Instead, it's not a membrane tank. The GFP is attached to the nuclei, so you can see here the nuclei. And in red, we have the blood, uh, blood cell marker, which, as I said, is not within the, uh, the nervous system, but adjacent. And then if we look at the repo animals, we start seeing cells which are green. Now, these cells are not any longer functional glia, but we can trace them. This is the tracer for the glia cells. Uh, because it's as the ripple <coughs> promoter hooked up with the GFP. And then we can see that some of these cells start expressing a blood cell marker. And this, in fact, is a, a, a transcription factor which is specific for the uh, building of the hemocytes. So this means that if you lose this from your domain containing protein, you start expressing plates that we never saw. Because if we lose GCM, we don't see any hemocyte appearing, we see neurons appearing. So how do we explain this? The explanation comes from the fact that while uh, repo is expressing only and all the glial cells, in early stages of development, prior to the stages that I just showed, um, 
GCM is also expressed in this region, which is called the prosephalic mesoderm. This prosephalic mesoderm gives rise to hemocytes. This is the region where the hemocytes develop. We could consider this as the equivalent of R, yolk, sac. And these hemocytes then uh, move. By the end of embryogenesis, they are located throughout the uh, animal. And then later on, most of them get concentrated under the tegument, and they become resident macrophages. So these are the cells that you saw yesterday um, and you uh, injected, uh, in, you didn't inject the cells, you injected the larvae to look at exactly the phagocytic activity of those cells. Now, <clears throat> what is really peculiar is that, um, first of all, the same gene is expressed in glia and in hemocytes which are the two major scavenger populations that are within and outside the nervous system. <coughs> this is the first finding. The second finding is that as in our immune system, we have very different ways of hematopoiesis. This is the first wave in the prosephatic mesoderm. So these hemocytes will populate the embryo, and they will stay in the larvae, and then they will continue even unto, until the adult. But in the larval stage, we have another set of, another hematopoietic organ, which is called the lymph gland, uh, which is histolized at uh, metamorphosis and produces a second population of hemocytes. Now, invertebrates, we know perfectly well that the ones the hemocytes that are coming from the yolk sac, the primitive hematopoietic wave, are very different in nature. These macrophages are produced in the yolk sac, they move either in the nervous system, like the microglia, or they produce the so-called resident macrophages, which are really in the tissues. And they are so different from each other that they don't even, are not even called anymore macrophages. They are called Kupfer cells, Langerhans cells, depending on where they land. And they are so much conditioned by the place where they are that they perform different things and they are epigenetically different <coughs> one from the other. So I think uh, this idea of having different waves is something that has evolved very early in development. And we are very lucky because in, uh, in the case of this year, it is specifically expressed in the first wave and not in the second wave. So we now have a tool to look at the role of a specific population. We all know that typically, for example, for microglia, um, these are the cells that are absolutely fundamental for the development of the nervous system. Uh, you, if you look at the mouse, at P1, uh, if you have no microglia, there will be no reorganization of the synapses. And this uh, will lead to a very detrimental phenotype in the mouse. And we also know that if microglia don't perform in our body, we end up with a number of diseases that are schizophrenia. Yes. <coughs> so this means that <coughs> these uh, macrophages, which are very old because they stay out <laughs> for months, <laughs> basically, um, they have a very fundamental function in our body. And we're finding exactly the same thing in flies. So these animals, if we basically play with this transcription factor, or if we kill these uh, hemocytes, we impinge on to viability, uh, second wave of hematopoiesis, proliferation of the nervous system. This means that we have uh, a very strong impact of these immune cells on physiology metabolism and development. So this was the first finding, but the other finding uh, that we, we were very struck about was the following. All the neuronal genes are conserved in evolution. Pronural genes, these are the genes that are imposed the neuronal differentiation. Uh, all the neurogenic genes, NOSH, DERT, and so forth, so they are all conserved. Synaptic genes, you name it, they are there. <laughs> uh, for glia, 
That is absolutely not the case. So GCM is there in mice, in humans, but mice don't survive that are muted for the two orthologs. One, because it's expressed in trophoblast, so in placenta, so <laughs> no role in, uh, in the sense. And the other one is necessary in palatinum, which are not via cells either. So the repo gene, which is the major target of GCN, is not even there in the genome of vertebrates. It's really anthropospecific. Another gene which is also expressed in via very early, which is um, a, a repressor, a transcription repressor, is not there either. So there must be something in evolution <coughs> that has um, made glia evolve at different times. And the reason why this happens is that if you are a neuron, you have to convey an electrical signal. Be it a bee, uh, an elephant, a man, whatever. If you are a glia sense, you will do very different things depending on the type of life that you have. As I said yesterday, um, we need myelin. And for good reasons. If you don't have myelin, you're not even able to walk. But the fly, you know, it's tiny. <laughs> they don't need myelin uh, because they don't, need, they don't have this electrical dispersal of the signal. So they cope in a different way. They have very large arcs and so forth and so on. So we need to have different functions throughout evolution. And maybe the glial cells have evolved at different times to cope with the different functions. So this is one thing. And the second point is that, well, we all like to say that what is present in flies, if it is there, it must serve. Because fly is important. I'm joking. So, so they, we also like to think that if it is there in flies, it must be there for good reasons. So the reason why we thought about that is that maybe uh, when we first cloned uh, the GCM gene flies, all the people that were working on uh, fly differentiation in humans, they jumped on that, that gene because they, they were desperately looking for a pioneer gene that could be necessary for the differentiation of astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, schwann cells, which are the glial cells of vertebrates. And they were absolutely disappointed because, as I said, it's required in the trophoblast and in paratyroid, so they took the bin, they took the knockout and they would throw it in the bin, basically. They just had one or two publications to show what the function was because they had the, the mice, but that was it. Um, so we revisited everything and we said, well, maybe our mistake, our, our as a community <coughs> mistake, was that we thought that GCM was ancestral in Fopia, but in fact it may be the ancestral gene for immune cells, which in glia are in, which in flies are glia and hemocytes, but not in vertebrates. So maybe we should check again the expression profile of the two orthologs in the immune system and see whether, instead of being expressed in Leah, are uh, expressed in the immune system. Which, by the way, <coughs> is a much more ancestral function as compared to Glia. Because everybody has to defend itself from the outside. Glia says may or may not be there, depending on the type of nervous system that you have. And there are low organisms that don't have Glia. So starting from this, we decided to revisit. Um, I have to say that was also for alimentary reasons, because uh, if you can make the comparison with vertebrates, you are much better off. So, but it was also <coughs> an intellectual you know, curiosity. Are we really dealing with something that will teach us um, how pathways have evolved? So what we did, we went back. Uh, a very patient Japanese postdoc learned how to isolate cells. First, to dissect tissues from mice, which was not our cup of tea, but we did it. Then we isolated cells from the new system, the bone marrow, the spleen, the thymus, whatever, and they did find expression. Fine. We created the knockout for one of those genes, uh, because one of them is more expressed in the new system than the other, and it was viable. So big thing. But I think we have to learn again from flies. So if we remove GCM from the fly, hemocyte, 
spies don't care, really. They stay there. They are alive, they reproduce, which is the most important thing that you have to do in life from the evolutionary perspective. perspective. So it's okay. But if you challenge flies with any inflammatory challenge, you have an inflammatory response that is well-defined flies. And if you do that in a GCN Newton, the flies explode. The inflammatory response is absolutely exacerbated. And they don't do well at all. So having seen that, now we are revisiting this in the mouse. And we are doing different things. First of all is to take cells um, from uh, the mutant and see whether they react differently to challenges. And the other thing that we are doing in collaboration with uh, a scientist at the ICM in Paris, who is absolutely expert in multiple sclerosis mouse models, and to see, can we see cells that are uh, expressing the GCN genes? Because nobody has seen any expression in vivo, because the antibodies are PDP. So we said, well, maybe if we have an immune challenge, we will be able to visualize GCM expression orthodox in, in mice better. So this is his work, it's not our work. So maybe, don't ask me questions of that. <laughs> so, so this is the spinal cord, and what Brahim did at the ICM was to inject this molecule, which is lysolecithin LPC. Uh, this is a molecule that induces acute and focal demyelination, but most importantly, it induces an inflammatory response. The reason we wanted to do so is that uh, they have different models for multiple sclerosis, and microglia are absolutely important in this. Uh, we started with this because it's a faster readout. Then the, the goal is to go with EAE, which is called, which is the model for multiple sclerosis called experimental autoimmune encephalitis, and that is a much longer term for our project. And we want to do on one side see whether are conditions that you can induce either by LPC in this acute uh, model or in uh, EAE induced by induction of monk, uh, injection of monk antibody, uh, whether we can see the expression of these genes coming in close to the lesion, and second, whether that changes in, uh, in, in mutant, uh, conditional mutant for the GCN genes. So this is the spinal cord, which is the equivalent of the cord. And the, uh, here we have the lesion that is induced by LPC. And this is the marinate lesion here. So you can see here the lesion. So we have no expression of the myelin protein in this region here, because there is a lesion. And then you follow for different genes, uh, days. And the time course is very stereotypical in the sense that here we have recruitment of macrophages and migration of macrophages and microglia. Here we have the differentiation of OPC, the oligodendrocyte precursors, and here we have the degree myelination. So from 0 to 30 D days, we have different uh, features that are uh, observed. And what we saw specifically in this time window here is the expression can I dim the lights? If we have this GCN2 antibody here, uh, labeling, this is a double labeling with uh, CD45, which is a marker for macrophages, you will see that in this sense, you specifically find the expression of GCN2. This is not earlier, it's not later. And this is the time when you really have the inflammatory response. So we are absolutely excited by that. Uh, because it uh, uh, answer our question that maybe we have to deal with uh, a very different pathway in evolution, which is not glia, but it is immune cells. And the very satisfactory issue is that we also did experiments with the EAE model. We started doing experiments with the EAE model. And the way they do, as I said, they inject the more antigen, which induces chronic and long-standing demyelination. Here we have recovery, but with the MOC induction, we don't have recovery. And in that case, you go for clinical score. So 
the screen can score and you know they are able to walk, they are able to do different things, and the, it goes from one to five, five dead data. So the dead animals you cannot analyze anymore, of course, but what we did, we took the, the scores that went from one to four, and according to the score, we saw increased levels of GCM expression. Okay. So now I think the challenge is to identify really these cells. This could be macrophages, could be macrophia, but it could be any kind of scavenger cells. And then to do the same experiment in the conditional mutant to see whether we can also see, as in flies, an impact on the inflammatory response. And what we've seen in flies is that this is not a gene that stops the inflammation. It's simply a gene that imprints uh, a non-inflammatory state. And the reason why I think it's very exciting is that if you are constantly, um, in, in the normal life, we all get some kind of inflammatory challenge, but this, you know, there are priorities in life. There are small inflammatory challenges, there are big inflammatory challenges. So you don't want to be constantly with an, uh, an inflammatory response on. So you have to have an active break to make uh, it possible that when you really need it, it jumps up. And I think this is what is happening with GCM. It's really like a rheostat, and it keeps uh, the inflammatory response <clears throat> silent so that when you really need it, it blasts. So this is all uh, I would like. I guess I should have. I wanted to show today, so we, to recapitulate, I showed you that Leah's, different types of LIA accomplish different function, but nevertheless, one and a single uh, gene is necessary for the different cell types. So I think in the future, now that we have all these kind of uh, very cool uh, tools, we can really identify uh, the transcriptome of the different cell types and see what they really do. For example, one thing that we already know is that although these cells are very similar to hemocytes, they don't express the same scavenger receptor. So this is to say that as in microglia, they are not simple macrophages. They are really specialized cells to provide help to the nervous system. Because they must recognize different antigens present in the axons or the neuronal cell bodies as compared to what they find outside the nervous system. This is, I think, also an important point, uh, because some of the domain has always been seen like, uh, you know, those who are there to keep things going, not really very exciting genes. <laughs> but in reality, these genes are a fundamental uh, player to really keep a faith stable. And if they are not there, um, there is a lot of plasticity, which is still possible in cells. And that was, I don't think it was suspected, except that in many, many cases during development, you have a pioneer factor which is necessary at the beginning, and then it goes away. So someone else has to take the job and do uh, that the same um, maintenance of the faith throughout life. So uh, glia and blood share the same molecular functional features, and we are looking into this conserved immune function. So this was a project that uh, started many, many years ago. So many people contributed to it. Uh, the first one who started was uh, actually the, my first postdoc, Roberto Bernardoni, who discovered that this GCMG, and who is now uh, uh, in Bologna, is has his own group, and he discovered that GCM was expre is still expressed in the hemocytes, and then he continued uh, with the mixed uh, feelings and mixed uh, <laughs> events uh, with other people, and now we have uh, uh, finally been able to point to the real role of this gene, which was very hard to tackle because it was really a moderator, and that is the work of uh, Wild Basi, who just left, and this paper is now under revision in life, and uh, this is the patient, uh, Japanese postdoc, as you can suspect. Uh, Alex uh, has been taking over, Alex uh, Pavlidati is taking over the role of the GCM genes in vertebrates, and Pierre Cacno has been doing a lot um, on, on the bioinformatics part. Uh, Naid, Brahim Naid Mesma has been uh, uh, very important to us because he's been doing a lot of uh, uh, experiments with the mice. And uh, Susan Chan is an immunologist here at IGBMC. 
um, Catherine has learned, taught us how to do the microglia culture so that we can challenge them. And uh, that's it, I think. And so my, uh, Nicola and, and Giacomo are collaborating with the project that I mentioned yesterday on the chromatin. And thanks to you. Thank you very much.